Welcome to the Influencer Podcast. Special guest today, Alex Minicucci, who is basically what every software entrepreneur wants to be when they grow up. Alex buys companies, builds them, sells them, kind of living the dream for everyone who does SaaS or software as a service. So Alex, thanks for joining. We're going to get to Relentless Management Group, your company, in a moment. First, let's give us that background. Where'd you start before you were doing the role that every software entrepreneur dreams of? Oh, well, you know, uh, first of all, thanks, uh, Ben, for having me on here. I'm excited to uh, go through and, and talk to you guys and, and be part of your network. Yeah, I guess you know, I started out, uh, you know, strangely enough, a uh, semi-typical story in the tech business. Dropped out of college my first year in. Um, you know, learned what I was a mechanical engineer, learned what a career in engineering looked like, um, saw this internet thing starting to get popular back in 1996. I'm dating myself here. And uh, I said, man, I got to be a part of this. This is going to change the world. So I um, went and bought a book on how to write code and came up with my first idea and have never looked back. So um, just fell in love with uh, everything about the internet, uh, its capabilities, its strengths. And um, and it's powered it to create you know different business models around it. That's great. Was that first company the one that got you your kind of critical trajectory? Did you, did you have a few startups before you kind of got the momentum building that you yeah. have today? You know, the, the first one gave me a great start. You know, I it was actually an online yellow page, so there weren't really search engines yet. There were a bunch of uh, early stage websites, and back then you would see a site that said Alex's favorite links, and that's how you found stuff. Um, so uh, I had an idea to create online yellow pages. Uh, I found a partner to uh, invest a, a very small amount of money to help us get started. And then um, it grew very quickly. And at 19 years old, I sold my half back to him for 150 grand. So you know, for a 19 year old, I have 150,000 in your pocket. Like that was pretty good. Of a taste. Yeah, that's pretty uh, good. The opportunity yeah. and, and certainly with a springboard for the, for the next project. Yeah, that's great. So um, Alex, you've been promoted in Success Magazine, Deloitte's fastest growing companies, featured in the Inc. 5000, fastest growing companies. These are all great honors. What inspired you to kind of keep going from being that 19-year-old with the cash in your pocket versus heading over to the beach and chilling out for a little while? You know, uh, when I talk to people about being an entrepreneur, the first question I ask is why? And there are a lot of people that like to do something that don't necessarily need to be an entrepreneur doing it. Um, you love to make food. That doesn't mean you need to own a restaurant. And so I look at entrepreneurism as a fire in your belly. like something that you just can't really describe, but you just know you have to go do. And I didn't have any particular income goals or revenue goals or uh, some magic number I had to hit. I just knew that I love to innovate. I love to be part of the game. And uh, and then I had ideas going crazy when you know getting early stages of the internet of opportunities, and I just had to be in the game and go do it. So there wasn't a hesitation. And actually, throughout my life, I've had several exits. And uh, my wife told me, you know, one time I said I'm gonna take a year off, and I made it a three day weekend and started a business <laughs> that following Tuesday. So I just like being in the game. I love what I do, and uh, it's just something I it's a lifestyle I have to live. That's great. The three day weekend, the extra day off after. So in your, <laughs> yeah, let's talk about that one. Cause that, that was giving me my next question about your biggest win. So you're buying, selling SaaS businesses. I assume that was the biggest win. Is that the case or what was, let's say biggest win. And then tell me your most interesting business as well. The biggest win was uh, a company I built called the SMS masterminds. Um, that was pretty exciting. That was the one that made the 5,000 list. Uh, when I built that company it was coming on the tail end of the financial crisis in 2008, uh, if you can build a business at the tail end of a recession like that, I mean, you're, you're going to build something that's even stronger when the economy improves. Um, that was a that was really, I felt like I had had a, a handful of, of great experiences under my belt and really felt dialed and organized when I put that business together. And, and, it, and, it, and it really showed the experience I had really showed in that one. And um, that was an eight-figure exit, and that was pretty solid. Uh, no investors. Partners um, and um, and that 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 one that was that was a great exit. So my most interesting exit, uh, probably going back to my very first one. Uh, it was it was an exciting time. Everything was very new. It was my first time starting a business. Uh, very bootstrap, very grinder. Uh, the business was an online yellow pages, and I actually typed in the entire county yellow pages by hand. Um, so <laughs> no, that was no uh, that was a lot of long days and. 
um, a lot of uh, Mountain Dew and Doritos in the middle of the night, typing meal pages in. And so that was my start. And uh, it was very satisfying to see an exit on something like that and, and make that the springboard moving forward. So uh, uh, that, that was a very exciting opportunity for me. That's great. That's a great story. It's a great lesson for everyone who, especially starting out, they kind of, if you just read the press and sites and TechCrunch and all that, hey, I want to raise money and I want to have someone else build my business for me. And you were, what, 18 or 19, 18 maybe when you started. So nobody's going to give you money. And there you go. I mean, you talk about the grind out and typing in the uh, word by word, character by character. Oh, yes, definitely. You know, that's that's kind of the com common strategy now is you come up with an idea and then find people to fund it. And, uh, and I tell people there are a lot of steps you can take to prove the model or start building revenue early in a model. Um, and it, it you as an entrepreneur it gives you more power. Uh, the more you prove it out, the higher your valuation is. So when you take that money really early, uh, it just changes the dynamic a little bit. And you know, maybe I call that a little old school now, but um, I love to see people that get in there and, and show a little grit and uh, invest in themselves. And, and then there's always a time to bring on money and scale. Their investors are looking for those opportunities, but uh, it's always nice to prove as much as you can um, with your with your your own your own efforts and market. Yeah, I mean, Sammy, you think about your big exit, and that's a that's so much more money and impressive that you were able to take it coast to coast yourself versus if you're raising early, some of those exits, you're getting a very small percentage of the pie, right? After you go through the seed, series A, series B, series G, right? And uh, at the end of that, you're you're lucky to come out with a slice. Um, yeah, that's, that. a, that's, a, that's a great point is I've had people have a $100 million exit, but they own 2% of the company. And right. um, and you know I I have a three million dollar exit, but I own one hundred percent. And so uh, you know you have to really look at the dynamics. I ask a lot of people, what would three million dollars do to your world? Like you had three million in the bank right now, and so a lot of people are trying to build hundred million dollar companies, but they don't need to. And sometimes the dynamic, the effort, the complexity of, of taking a year to try to raise money, when if you could build something to a three million dollar exit and sell to a strategic who's going to take it from there. And now you're empowered. You take a million, you, you, you buy a house cash, um, you put another million in long-term savings, you got a million to buy a couple of toys with, uh, or put a half million in the X project. Um, now you've got strength, you've got power, you've got a foundation to build off of. So I tell a lot of people, you know, hit the singles and doubles, be realistic in your expectations, set yourself up for success instead of always unicorn building, because that's, uh, that's it's not realistic statistically to, to hit every time. Yeah, it's a great way of putting it, getting that early lead. It's as that saying, the first million's the hardest. But when we account for inflation, it's probably, like you said, the two or three million, right? That you yeah. want to get that <laughs> first. But like you said, you get that under your belt and then you can kind of play offense and you don't have to necessarily go and raise money in subsequent efforts either. You can if you want to, or you can sell strategically again, like you like you said to somebody like Relentless. So on, on, on that mm -hmm. note, you're not done in terms of business building. You guys still... My impression is you still operate a lot of the companies that you buy. You're still growing them. Um, sometimes you leave the do you, do you leave the current management in place sometimes, or are you bringing in your own? How does that look from your relentless portfolio standpoint in terms of the companies that you've bought? How many are you running and growing? How many are you, um, I guess, I don't want to say outsourcing, but the management is being handled by by someone else? Yeah, we've got a we've got a couple of different models we work with. Uh, we've got a dozen companies in our portfolio now. Nine of them we own, or I own wholly. Um, so our uh, shared management team operates those companies, and uh, and we build them with our internal staff. Three of them were uh, existing partners or founders who built companies who came to us for help. And I always thought it was uh, antithetical to to have a, an early stage company come to you and then charge them. A whole bunch of cash uh, for you know to, to help them out. They don't have cash. That's one thing they don't have. So what we do is is we will actually, if we like the project, to trade uh, equity for our services. So we've had companies say uh, usually they're going to use the cash for engineering and sales, uh, maybe some leadership, some strategic guidance or support. So we'll say, hey, give us a piece of your company. We become a partner, and you can access my engineering team. You can access my sales team. Uh, we'll meet with you once a week and provide strategic guidance and support, help you with budgeting, forecasting. Um, we even helped our companies raise money if they need to. So, um, so yeah, we've got a hybrid model where we oftentimes work with founders and try to support them, uh, give them the resources they need, and a little bit of guidance based on our experience to try to be successful. We, 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 I love an opportunity 
to uh, mentor a strong founder and, and help them get over that hump and, and successful. Yeah, that's great. That's very founder friendly model because that's, that's here, but it's exactly usually what these small lean teams that are bootstrapped, self-funded need is um, uh, we've all been there. Right. And, and we're there today. You need the, uh, like you said, at times the engineering help, and then you need to sell it. Right. And you've got those two things and those take money and can't necessarily charge for it. But it sounds like you've got a lot of scale internally on the relentless team where, and, and, and we know that from the influencer work that we're doing together um, where you've got, Seems to be economies of operational scale, should we say, where you can have someone doing a certain marketing role and they could do that for five companies instead of just one. Is that fair? Yeah, to say? absolutely. I mean, we. Well, I mean, if you think about the structure, it's almost like a services company, but we're servicing ourselves. So we've got a full stack engineering team that's managing a dozen platforms. Uh, and you're right. At that point, I can I can afford to hire better people than a single company. Yeah, I can typically do. I can afford to put processes in place and leverage software for project management, things like that, that a startup can't afford. Uh, on the support team, like we have great support software and systems uh, because we're managing support on a dozen companies. So we try to leverage that and create some economy to scale to be able to have better software, better processes, and better people. And, and yeah, that gives us great economy to scale uh, internally and allows uh, customers to have a better experience in our, our projects to have a higher quality uh, platform and, and go to market strategy. Yeah, it makes sense. It's, it's funny with startups, how many jobs are like part-time jobs, but you have a million of them, right? But they're all, yeah. it's a little slice and it'd be overkill maybe to hire a full-time person, but you want the care of a full-time person. And that kind of strikes me as a pretty ideal where you can have a full-time person touch multiple companies or maybe all nine, right? Because it's the same thing. I know from starting these, this is my third SaaS company. And every time I start one, you do the same thing, right? And you know this, right? You're doing the same thing every time. So it's a, it's a repeatable model. So for you to have your portfolio makes perfect sense. Let's get into mobile advertising, Alex, because you were one of the first guys to notice the advantages of mobile. And now, I mean, everyone's on, on the phones. The sites are more mobile than desktop in terms of access. Um, where do you see mobile going? Do you see any huge gaps that you're filling with your relentless teams that others aren't out there? Well, you know, I think mobile is exciting, but a lot of people use it incorrectly. When we started getting on the phones, the first logic was take my platform or take my site and get it to fit on a phone. People are looking for a different experience on mobile than they are uh, at a desktop. And so the functions, the information, um, the way I interact with it, what I want to see, what I want to do is typically very different than what somebody would do sitting down in a machine and, you know, at a full desktop machine and operating. So I think it, it's it's a logic shift and we're starting to build many of our platforms mobile first and then building the PC or desktop component of it where, uh, you know, that can be more robust, take advantage of the landscape of larger screens and things like that, um, better input devices with traditional keyboards and things. But um, but starting with the mobile experience because it's a psychological difference. What are people going to want to do with this thing and how? Uh, and, and getting better at building that mobile first because we're seeing, of course, uh, many people spend much more time on their phones than they do on uh, on desktops nowadays. I mean, I can go. I mean, I can run ninety eight percent of my business now on mobile, um, and so I only use I use computer day to day. I'm still old school. I still like a mouse. Very sadly, I don't like a trackpad. <laughs> um, and I need a keyboard. So, you know, I, I prefer those things an input device, but my my 21 year old kid, uh, they don't like, they, I mean, they, they never use computers except for school. Uh, everything else is their entire lives are on mobile. So it's, it's very, very different. As far as gaps, I still think SMS technology is underutilized. Uh, if you think about, you go like WhatsApp and a lot of those, like that two way communication, it's, it's personal and transactional. So when you think about that, like we we love that. It's simple. It's it's low bandwidth on creative. So you're not having to design really compelling graphics or write tons of copy or have an edited video, but you can still convey information. You can create a valuable call to action and you can solve people's problems. Like that's that's what we do. When you text people, it's, hey, what are you doing for lunch? Let's meet here. Great to see you there at noon. Uh, I mean, transactions are happening every day. And I think that people are not connected enough uh, with each other uh, in an organized way, as well as with 
businesses that are uh, an important part of their lives. So I still think there's a lot of runway for using text messaging in a predictive and interactive way to do business. And uh, I think that there's a lot of room to evolve and, and cultivate that over time. And then that's where some of our platforms, uh, particularly what we're going to talk about today, uh, really uh, focuses on SMS technology and its course. So. That's a great point uh, that backs up our experience. We do these calls with new customers who are not as tech savvy as your team, and we walk them through the Influencer app. And when we were email only on reminders, decent amount of no-shows. And now that we allow SMS reminders, almost no, everyone shows up, right? Because it's buzzing <laughs> your phone and it's it's hitting you from all angles, right? But there's something about that phone buzzing that, oh, okay, I've got a call now. I've got to go on or email. Maybe you see it, maybe you don't. Maybe it's on your phone. Maybe they're, right? You So you don't know where you're at there. So let's do, let's talk about your portfolio companies there, Alex, on the SMS side. Um, yeah, hit us with a couple um, examples there, what, what we want to talk about. Yeah, well, um, I mentioned my, you know, my big exit, the eight-figure exit was was focused on uh, SMS texting technology. We, it was a loyalty program of small businesses connecting consumers. Uh, that was SMS-based, but 12 million people on it. Um, that did very well, and we would see response rates that were really out of this world. Um, so we've we've taken that concept and, and those technologies and are adapting it to a lot of our different platforms. One is uh, a health and wellness CRM type tool where it helps uh, fitness professionals and coaches connect with leads, active clients, and former clients, stay in touch, but also provide accountability. Uh, it's called off day trainer. And so um, if you think about most of your personal trainers or coaches, we usually text you, hey, see you today. Or, you know, don't forget to work out. But it's a lot of work on the part of the trainer. And so it's an automated tool that actually stays in touch with their client base using text. But it comes from the trainer. It feels like the trainer is sending them. And the message are personalized to that trainer. So, you know, with any good marketing, you know, the, the target and personalization is absolutely key. And so we build a lot of technology that really feel like they're coming from that, per that uh, individual that you have a relationship with and, uh, and have a call to action that's very specific to the recipient. Um, that's why we get uh, great uh, response rates. Our other one that's one uh, that we're working with uh, influencer on is uh, is uh, our challenge engine tool. And that's uh, that's a, a variation of that where we help empower coaches of all sorts. Anybody that's uh, an influencer or trainer that wants to convey information to their trusted audience via text message. It cuts through the chatter, um, cuts through, you know, we don't care what operating system you're on. We don't, you don't have to download the app. Um, you don't have to do anything. I mean, everybody gets the text message and 98% of them are read within five minutes. So we know to your point a second ago about appointment reminders, uh, that's the thing that stops people in their tracks. Uh, you know, people will sit there in, in meetings checking text messages. So it cuts through everything and uh, and inspires action immediately. So that's why um, we love using that tech for, for a lot of our stuff. This is great. And we'll get the link to the collab below this video, wherever people are, are watching on challenge engine, we've got, and you've got an 80% commission share. Is that correct? Can we talk about the uh, partner opportunity then from the influencer side in terms of working with challenge engine and specifically to our influencers who are U S based in the sports, fitness, wellness, and so on world. Yeah, absolutely. So w the reason why we call it challenge engine is um, there are a lot of uh, people that love a kind of a finite engagement. Um, and think of it in the fitness world, and, and most fit pros will know this, you know, 30-day belly buster challenge or 21-day push-up challenge or 75-day beast mode challenge. And so that's something that people can commit to psychologically. Uh, it's got a start and stop, and you have a prescriptive engagement during a certain period of time. So the challenge with that is always creating a curriculum, creating a delivery method, and how do you manage uh, and scale a, a, an opportunity to do that? Well, that's why we built the challenge engine. So influencers can log into our system uh, at zero cost up front to create an account and create a challenge. So we do this because we want to be performance oriented and really great partners for our influencers. So you, you log into the account and we have a handful of curriculum already in it. So believe it or not, we've got 30 days to optimize your LinkedIn profile or um, uh, I mentioned the like 30 day uh, fitness challenge. So we've got some in there if you don't want to write your own curriculum, but you do want to promote something that's effective to your audience. So you can just use one of ours and literally in 60 seconds can have a challenge set up and something you can circulate, promote, 
and uh, and earn revenue from immediately. And yes, it's an 80 percent split to the influencer. So that's what they get on everything that's sold. So the average uh, challenge we put together is going to sell for thirty, forty dollars as a thirty day challenge. We suggest about a dollar a day. If you build your own content, which you absolutely can, uh, you can set each day with a text and a corresponding page of information. So it could have an inspirational quote or today uh, I'm going to give you a recipe for my favorite uh, soup. And then they click the link and you have the recipe for the soup in that link. Again, all mobile enabled so text and mobile web. Uh, so it loads right up. And you can have every morning that text go out. You can have one go in the evening saying, hey, did you do your run today? Or what did you think of the soup? And then solicit feedback. The beautiful thing about our system, people can respond and you create a dialogue with your customer base. So you can create your own curriculum. You can charge whatever you want for it. And we simply do revenue share as you promote it. When you create a challenge, it automatically creates a registration page. So very simply, it gives you a link that you can promote to your audience. And there's two ways to set challenges up. One is everybody starts at the same time. So, hey, I'm going to do a September challenge. It starts on September 1st, sign up now. And then on the 1st, it begins your 30-day sequence. Or it could start the day after somebody registers. And uh, so if you say, hey, I've got a 30-day weight loss challenge, as soon as somebody signs up, they'll receive a text for the confirmation. The next day, they get day one of the challenge and begin their own journey on their own. Um, so you just promote the registration link and say, hey, I've got this great program put together. People can click, sign up. We do the billing. And that's the other part. We've done some challenges, some things like this before in the past with tech. We had a lot of influence say, you know, I don't want to deal with registration page. I don't want to, I don't want to make landing pages. Um, I don't want to deal with billing. I don't want to deal with Venmo. I just want something simple. So now literally in 60 seconds, you can create a challenge. It creates a landing page. You promote it. We build it. We send you your 20% at the end of each day. Or I mean, your 80% at the end of each day. And uh, and then you just continue to promote it and it becomes a, a great revenue stream for you. That's a great influencer product. Let me ask you, where do you think in general the influencer marketing world is going from here? You were early in on mobile. What's next over the next few years for the influencer creator world here in terms of marketing, partnerships, and so on? I think the influencer world just gets bigger, better, and more important. You know, the, I'm a big e-commerce guy. I've been involved in e-commerce for a long time. Reviews and social proof have been that cornerstone of buying decisions. Um, we, those are the first things you look for, recommendations from people like you, uh, reviews that prove that the product has worked and that the seller is reputable. So that creates trust. And I think the influencer side of the industry is really the next level of that. Is I, I want to look for someone that I can relate to, someone that's demonstrated themselves as an industry expert that I can trust, and that's the operative word, to give me guidance, recommendations, and support on the things that I need in my life. So I think that it just gets even more and more prevalent. Uh, it just gets, it, what it really needs is to be more organized. Uh, and that's why I think the platform here is, is really special because it helps uh, people who have products and services like me um, connect with uh, the influencers that have built the trust, that are industry experts that can vet out and prove that I've built something good and then help guide the people that are looking for this to the product. So it's really about relationships and trust. Um, I think the influencer uh, industry is, is really important and, and will, will just become more so. Oh, that's great to hear. Uh, and we love hosting your collabs. And I think you made a great point on the product reviews. That's something that we probably don't talk about enough as a benefit of this where, I mean, people want reviews and this is a great way to get them, right? Whether you're shipping your e-commerce product to influencers and you want, that's a great call to action, leave a review, right? Five-star reviews, those are out there forever. And that's something we're playing around with uh, on the platform. Hopefully we'll have some more features in there to make that easier to ship something and get that review and all that good stuff. Um, I must say, I think you've got my favorite background of our podcast series to date on BeRelentless.com. Talk about the wine and sushi get-togethers that you um, host. We'd love to do this over wine and sushi next time that we get together, if that works for you. I love it. I love it. It would be my pleasure. That's awesome. Yeah. Looks like a, yeah, a lot of fun on the shelf behind you there. So a lot of potential <laughs> for <laughs> lots of creative talk. So thanks again, Alex. Let us know um, where can our listeners, influencers, viewers, where can they find you? Where can they follow you online? 
Um, yeah, you know, the, the website is berelentless.com, berelentless.com. Um, the best way to get there, you can see a little bit more about our team, our services, and our portfolio companies. Um, and of course, on your platform, uh, you can search Challenge Engine. That's the the current, uh, and we're going to be launching uh, multiple offerings on the side, but that's the one that we're promoting right now that I described the Challenge Engine. So search Challenge Engine on there and you get more information about the collab on, on that one. That's great. Thanks again. And we will get the Challenge Engine link and all your future collabs um, in there as we get the podcast out there. So we'll make sure to get the links on there so people can can click, make it convenient. Uh, thanks again, Alex. So yeah, like I mentioned, this is the the dream. Every software, you know, everyone wants to be Alex when they grow up. They want to buy, build, <laughs> and sell. Uh, not as glamorous at the start of of typing stuff in, but this is this has been a great interview. It's all stuff people need to hear in terms of how to roll up your sleeves and and get moving here on the entrepreneurship side. Yeah, man, I really appreciate that. Um, it's been a great journey. I wouldn't have it any other way. Anybody out there that's that's going down this path. You know, uh, uh, if you want to reach out, I'm always happy to help, uh, mentor, give you any guidance or support and, uh, and keep hanging in there. That's why I named my company Relentless, was I thought, you know, what was the one characteristic that most influenced my success? And it's it's not genius and it's it would almost be lucky, but really, the, you know, the perseverance and the hard work and sticking with it, that uh, really is key. So those of you watching um, that are going through the journey, stick with it because, uh, you know, it's worth it. Oh, that's a great way to describe it because you, you, I mean, luck's a part of it, but you give yourself more chances, right? By being relentless, right? By you, you stay in the game, right? And you, you stay after it and you put yourself in position. So at that point, it's not necessarily luck. It's more probability, I guess, than, than luck per se, right? You're, you're, you're staying in there and, and it's because of your hustle. Absolutely. 100%. Cool. All right. Well, thanks again, Alex. Appreciate it. It was fun, fun conversation. Yeah, but I appreciate it a lot. It was uh, my pleasure to be on the, on the podcast today.